And we are back on the build phase. I'm Mr. Ben. And today we are going over to Discord and we are going to look at card by card the entire Children of Lilith expansion. So these were posted in the spoilers channel of the Versus System Illuminati Discord uh, earlier today. And before I get right into the cards, the liner notes for the set are also pictured here. All right. This issue, Children of Lilith Ark. This issue features the Lilin, the demonic spawn of the demon Lilith and characters of the Midnight Suns, a team of supernatural superheroes attempting to stop them. Will you aid Lilith in her wicked and chaotic plans, or will you stand up against her evil with the might and magic of the Midnight Suns. Okay, so we're going to get a whole arc of this based on that. And I'll look at the rest of the liner notes if we actually have a question. Okay, so Lilith, level one, three, five, six. Reveal the top five cards from your deck. Put a Lilin from among them into your hand and shuffle the rest into your deck. So this is the main character that we've looked at a couple times. Uh, this card was revealed on Upper Deck's website, and I believe it was the... Level two, I think, or maybe I have that backwards. One of them was revealed at Midwinter as price support. And, but this whole time we haven't known what Lilins are. Well, looking at card number three in the expansion, Lilin is a keyword. And this says, so I guess I'm going to skip past the main character and go to the, some of these supporting characters. So one cost underworld affiliated one, one, one meat market Lilin. Meat Market has plus three, plus three while attacking a good enemy character, Rotting Body. When an enemy character gets KO'd on your turn, put two plus one counters on Meat Market. So does he get, do all Lilins get plus three, plus three while attacking a good character? Oh, it looks like they do. Okay, so we have a two cost, a three cost, four, five, six. Is it a whole curve of Lilins? A seven and an eight. Yeah, so... We have a whole uh, curve of Lilin characters, and apparently what Lilin means is it's a keyword that gives that particular character plus three, plus three, while attacking a good character. Okay, so to circle back to Lilith, gosh, this is going to be confusing. Uh, she can pay a blue and then basically grab one of these Lilin out of the top five cards of your deck. In order for her to level up, you're gonna to have to have Lilin characters appear on your side five times. So yeah, her superpower feeds directly into her level up condition. Uh, stats of three, five, six are fine. Like that's pretty good actually. Uh, at level two, she becomes a six, nine, six, and then gets a whole bunch of superpowers. So create Lilin, uh, build phase, pay a red, search your deck for a Lilin, reveal it and put it into your hand or summon Lilin, build phase yellow, put a Lilin from your hand onto your side. That feels strong. So you get to recruit a six drop and play a six drop for free. That would be awesome. Absorb Lilin, pay a green, KO a Lilin on your side if you do heal a wound from Lilith. Oh, that's kind of cool. And respawn Lilin, pay a blue, shuffle a Lilin from your KO pile into its owner's deck. Wow, that last one is pretty bad but you're probably going to be using your blues on her level one to pull Lilins out of your deck to begin with. So I don't think I care about that at all. Six, nine, six, uh, that's fine for a level two. Like nine is a pretty decent size, but six is not the best attack for a level two, but she's doing a lot of other stuff. Now, clearly this is a deck that is going to want to pack probably as many Lilins into it as possible to satisfy the level up condition. And then there's all of this synergy on the level two. So immediately I kind of look at this as sort of like a, almost like a pre-constructed deck, like a deck in a box. Now I don't, we, we don't have pre-cons in verses, but there have been times where we've gotten expansions and it's like, okay, this, this whole expansion is just basically for this one deck. And that's not the case for the whole expansion, but for, it looks like probably about half of the expansion is setting up Lillian with this character specific gimmick that involves an entire curve of characters. Just now I haven't looked at all the characters yet, so I can't make a value judgment on whether or not this is going to work, 
but just as a concept, I think this is really, really cool. I love the idea of having this main character that has their whole kit. Well, I guess it is a little paint by numbers because you know you're going to have to do these certain things. So the area where you're going to be able to sh sort of show your flourish as a deck builder is going to be around the edges with the plot twists, the location counts, uh, maybe tech options that you include. Do you go loyal with this? Uh, there's a lot of ways to look at what this gimmick is bringing to the table. Is it going to be powerful enough to win games in a competitive space? I don't know. We're going to dive into the Lillian characters here in a second. But just thematically, I think this is a win. And as a gameplay mechanic, like as a gimmick of things to have me doing, uh, I think this is very, very cool. So let's circle back to our one drop meat market. I don't like this guy. Uh, paying one and being able to attack with a 3-3 feels pretty good. And it's it's not a 3-3. It's a 4-4, actually, because it's he gets plus three, plus three. So paying one and being able to swing into an opposing main character with a 4-4 on turn one feels pretty strong. I have a feeling if you do that once, though, this guy is not going to survive for a second turn. Uh, the rotting body payoff of when an enemy character gets KO'd on your turn, put two plus one counters on meat market. Maybe that comes into play once. Maybe they play a one drop. You kill the one drop. He becomes a three, three, and then he gets immediately killed by the opposing main character on turn two. I can't see this guy sticking around. I can't see a world where he gets two plus one counters on him turn after turn. Like your opponent just isn't going to let that happen. And there's plenty of things that can, even if he gets the plus two or the two plus one counters on turn one and you're going first, there's just so many things your opponent can do to potentially neutralize this guy. I think I would probably bucket this guy almost like a plot twist in my head on turn one. Great. You play him, you put a wound on the enemy main character. Otherwise, this is a thing that you can pull out as a team attacker boost, like, an, a, like a plot twist that said give a character plus four attack for one recruit point. There are situations where you might want to play something like this, and that's kind of where I look at this guy fitting in. Now, obviously, in the Lillin deck, you're, <laughs> you're going to play him because he's a Lillin. Outside of that purpose, I'm not sure how far this guy's going to go outside of his gimmick deck. Uh, next up, we have a two-cost Underworld affiliated Skinner. I'm going to guess these guys are all Underworld. Let me just double check here real quick. Yeah, all this stuff is Underworld. So uh, this guy's a Lillin. And again, this keyword appears to be doing the same thing every time for all these characters. Plus three, plus three while attacking a good enemy character. So his printed stats are two, two, one. Uh, two cost two, two for one is pretty boring but he can swing for five if your opponent plays ball and is recruiting the right kind of characters on their turn. He also has razor sharp protrusion. Skinner has violent and lethal when attacking supporting characters. He strikes with doubles attack. And if he wounds it, KO it. Uh, violent and lethal is a heck of a combination of words. So without anything else, he could swing in as a four attack and wipe somebody off the board starting on turn two. If your opponent's playing ball, he could potentially attack for 10. Wow. A two drop that can attack for 10. I mean, they have to play ball. They have to be playing good characters in order to have him be better than just a two, two or a four attack with lethal into a supporting character. Uh, only one health. I'm not crazy about, but given that we have some of this Lilin recursion stuff going on with Lilith MC, maybe you can get away with that. The, yeah. Man, the idea of swinging into, like, you play a five drop with 10 defense, and I play a two drop and swing into it and murder your five drop without having to do anything else, that seems really crazy. Like, again, this guy is a two drop who, if he attacks into Sage, which is a very popular five drop, he has enough attack to stun the 10 attack, 10 defense Sage and lethal. Man, so this is a card, depending upon what you think the meta is going to be, if there is some high drop card that has defense 10 or less that you need a silver bullet for, like, I mean, it has to be a good card again. And that is a legitimate restriction. Like, I realize a lot of us probably don't build our decks thinking that much about good and evil because it hasn't been particularly relevant outside of 
a handful of plot twists, a handful of characters and one featured format. It's not a thing that we spend a lot of time considering in the game where there are so many other variables and, and things printed on cards that sort of rise to premacy over thinking about good or evil. But I mean, what was it two years ago where we got a set of expansions that cared a lot about good and evil? It feels like based on what we know about this Lilith one, that's exactly the angle they're shooting for here. So, OK, cool. They're leaning into some design space that we haven't seen them utilize quite as much. Um, in a format where your opponent is not playing good characters, if he's still not like the worst card in the world, I mean, he's a two drop that attacks for four and can. Le yeah, I I mean, probably he's not worth the slot unless you are trying to make sure you can hit a good enemy character. So that's going to be a meta call. Or if you're building the Lilith deck, like if you need Lilins in your deck, you play this guy because you need Lilins in your deck. But I, th I think this guy is probably going to have some legs outside of the strict Lilin deck based on the meta that we find ourselves in. Okay, next, let's move up to the three cost Lilin character. This is Nakoda. I, I think I'm pronouncing that right. Nakoda. Three cost, three, three, one, gets plus three, plus three while attacking a good enemy character. So she'll swing for six if your opponent plays ball. Demonic vision. When Nakoda appears, look at an enemy hand and choose a supporting character there. That player discards that card. Oh, man. I mean, I guess on turn three, if you look at the enemy hand and they have no supporting characters, you feel pretty good about uh, what they're going to be putting out to the field in subsequent turns but gosh i don't like these selective discard powers like let me let me just i mean i like seeing the hand uh and i guess if they're gun unlimited a supporting character is probably when i probably what i want to hit more than anything else yeah three three for three is fair being able to pluck your opponents three drop if you're going first or four drop, if you're going second out of their hand before they can play, it feels pretty good again, this one. So I'm, I'm going to say this one last time and then I'll stop repeating it for every card. If you're playing the Lilith deck where you need the Lilin cards, you're going to play this card, obviously. So in that deck, all of these Lilins are probably included in the Lilith deck outside of the Lilith deck though. I think it's a little more interesting to think about them in the broader card pool and Six attack on turn three is pretty relevant. Like that's very relevant. Six attack on turn three is one of those numbers that it can be at times meta defining, like the quality of your three drop being able to withstand a six attack or being able to put out six attack. Like that's a big deal. That's a big break point on turn three. Now you don't get it. You don't get the unwavering unless you're attacking into a good enemy character. So is she good enough just as a three, three for three that lets you take away your opponent's next turn recruit? Uh, maybe in a deck that also has some discard synergy. I'm not sure this is totally playable all by itself without something else going on. But if you've got like Mordo, this is another card that just forces your opponent to discard. I could see her being played there. And again, if you know you're in a meta where people are playing a lot of good characters early, this certainly lines you up. A 6-6 six, six on turn three is a big character. Like, don't we have a printed 6-6 six, six and his drawbacks are that he can't attack? <laughs> like, isn't that the beast from the Black Bog? He's a 6-6 six, six for three. He's passive. All right, moving on to Fang. This is, man, so are these all 1-1-2-2, one, one, two, two, three, three, four, four? Yeah, so they're going right up the curve. So I suppose I can do some more general analysis before we move our way through the rest of these. If they're all on curve, so this is a 4-4 four, four for 4, that's totally fair. It's not great. It's not exciting. But you're getting what you paid for in terms of board impact. Now, the upside on these cards is swinging into good characters. That's going to be highly meta dependent. We cannot count on that. And if your opponent has options, has good and evil characters in their deck, they're not going to play into this for you. So as much as I love a four mana seven, seven, which is what this guy has the potential to be, I think that's great. I don't know how often we're going to get it. His second power, formless mass, Fang can't be struck while melee attacking. That is just win more nonsense. I don't care. I don't care about that. Uh, I guess that's 
relative. If you have to play him as a 4-4 for four, 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 then that power is super relevant because you're probably going to get hit back. But if he comes down as a 4-mana 7-7, seven, seven, he's not getting hit back anyway. Like, who cares about being struck while melee attacking on a 7-7 seven, seven on turn 4? Uh, so that formless mass power, uh, sure, if your opponent isn't playing ball, this gives you a little bit more you can do with this guy other than just being an on-curve vanilla body. Uh, but that's not what you want. What you want is to attack into good stuff as a 4-mana 7-7. Seven, seven. All right, Doc. 5 cost, 5-5. Five, five. Has Lillin, so he attacks as an 8-8, eight, eight, which is gigantic. Cutting and creating. When Doc attacks, put a plus one counter on him and a minus one counter on the defender. All right, so worst case scenario, he's attacking for six and you are going to be one less than whatever you should be. That's kind of okay. On turn five, that feels really slow. But if your opponent is playing ball, the upside, if it's a good character, he's attacking for nine. Man, the analysis on all of these is kind of like, wow, this card is a little bit slow, unless your opponent plays a good card, in which case they're kind of amazing. Um, yeah, that holds true here. The power, it basically having a fair and balanced built into this guy every time he attacks, fair and balanced as a plot twist, doesn't see play as much these days, but back in the day, in the old days of Versus, that was a premier underworld plot twist. That plot twist saw a lot of play in the limited card pool of early verses. Having it now on an underworld character attached to a 5-5 five, five for 5. Yeah. I mean, it's plot twists are obviously a little bit more flexible than characters who have to attack. Like, there's ways that people can stop you from being able to use that by preventing him attacking or not having targets to attack or whatever. Cutting and creating is a completely acceptable keyword. Uh... Lillen is either useless or a huge deal, depending upon what your opponent is choosing to do. All right, six cost, blackout, unsurprisingly, also underworld, and also a 6-6, six, six, and also one health, and also has Lillen, plus three, plus three, while attacking a good enemy character, lights out. When blackout appears, you may daze an enemy character or turn an enemy location face down. That's great. Uh, we've seen powers like this on other characters in the past. Uh, I think the seven drop Morlin. Uh, it stunned a guy when he came into play. The, uh, was it the Duel Maw Leviathan? I don't know off the top of my head how many different cards we've seen a daze or stun an enemy character effect when these cards interplay, but this is always good. You just, like, turn six, this could be the turns where you're starting to think about things like pushing for lethal and actually being able to win the game. So being able to play your six drop and have that, get that annoying flight blocker out of the way, uh, and so you can just charge in and hit the main character or turn that location face down and turn off a superpower that would be problematic for you. That's a big deal. Now, is it a big deal enough that you spend your entire turn six on it and get a six, six on? So you, you have kind of a meh stick with this lights out power attached to it. That feels fine. If he comes down as a nine, nine though, like I feel a little silly saying it over and over again, but a nine, nine for six is pretty awesome. Coupled with that power, that seems strong. But do I want to play good characters? Maybe, maybe I just want to play evil characters and avoid letting you have any of these extra stats. That doesn't feel great. Uh, seven cost, Creed. Oh, wow. I, I really like the art on this one. I don't know these characters at all, but this guy's like shooting his hand out and the way it's kind of coming towards the camera, like where we're seated as the audience. I, I really like this art. Actually, all of this art it is so reminiscent of the kind of comic art that I was reading as a kid. Uh, I'm not sure when these issues specifically got published, but this all reminds me of like 90s style comic book art that I grew up with. And I, it, it holds a very fond place in my heart, even though, again, I don't have nostalgia for any of these particular images. This style is something that I, I really enjoy. Okay, so he's a 7 cost 7-7. Seven, seven. He has Lillen and separate body parts, or separate, uh, separate body parts. When Creed gets KO'd, you may put a copy of him from your hand onto your side. So some percent of that time, that power is completely blank. That sucks. But some percentage of that time, it's just a free 7-7. Seven, seven. And that could stop a subsequent attack that was going to hit your your main characters hiding in the back row they attack into creed clear him out of the way haha -ha, i'm going to put a wound on you haha -ha, no you aren't uh it does require you to have 
multiple copies of a seven drop. How heavy do you want to go on turn seven? This does feel like this Lillian deck does feel like it wants to play on curve. So I think you can probably get away with going a little bit heavy on some of these higher drops, especially with this payoff synergy and all of the ways that Lillian has to thin the deck and get extra. Wait, did I say Lillian? All the ways that Lilith has to thin the deck and get extra Lillian cards into her hand. I think you can probably get away with playing enough copies of this guy to actually make this relevant. Now, is this as, as big a huge, like scary burst as like some other seven drops that we've seen over the years? No, we've seen printed 1010 attack seven drops over the years. We've seen, we've seen much higher impact plays overall. And because of that, outside of the Lillian deck, I don't know how much play this guy's going to have. I really don't. He doesn't have flight. You know, if he was a flight blocker that could replace himself, that might give him a little bit more playability. This feels like a card that's going to be for the Lilith deck and probably not see a lot of action outside of it. Uh, eight cost, Pilgrim. Underworld 881, Lilin and Mystical Portal. Lilin on your side can attack protected characters. Okay. So this like pseudo stealth gives your... or gives your whole curve pseudo stealth if you can get there. Uh, yeah, so if you live to turn eight and she's a six health main character, so the idea that Lilith could be getting to those later turns does seem pretty reasonable. Uh, and you've got a few things throughout the curve that can disrupt your opponent, slow them down, cause them some problems. So I think this is a deck that can probably get to turn eight. And then you play this on turn eight and all of a sudden all those flying blockers don't seem as good on your opponent's side. And you just send your Lilin in and finish people off. Uh, is this going to be playable outside of the Lilith deck? Absolutely not. It literally doesn't do anything outside of the Lilith deck. Like Lilin on your side can attack. I guess that means he can attack a protected character. So maybe there's some weird meta where you play this as your top end because you know there's going to be good main characters rotten in the format and you just want to be able to on turn eight swing in to a good main character with your what 12 attack no 11 attack and put a wound on somebody and you're just playing this guy because he has pseudo stealth no i don't think that's likely i don't think that's likely i think this is the top end for the deck that it clearly is designed for it's packaged with these cards uh overall before I get into the rest of the cards, I want to just take a second and kind of think about the Lillen deck. So a lot of this deck is going to be basically made for you. The resource colors are kind of scripted out. You don't have any supporting characters in the deck that use resources or locations. So you're only going to need to pay for superpowers on your main character or cards that you splash in off team. So Lilith definitely wants blues for that front side, and then every color except blue for the back side, which fits pretty good. Uh, given how kind of anemic the blue power on the back side is, like on her level two, I think you might think about throwing in some later game cards that use blue, or maybe something like latent mutation to shrink your enemies down. Uh, if you aren't fighting good characters, these stats probably aren't going to get there against a lot of decks. Like you're in a tough spot getting just on curve, like par for the course stats the entire way up the curve. If you're not getting those Lillian bonuses, that seems like a tough road to me. But as a gimmick deck, and and I don't, to be clear, I don't mean gimmick like in a pejorative way. Like it, I just mean it is a unique feature. Like I call the Sinister Six Sin, like they're the way the sinister six main characters work i refer to that as the sin six gimmick so i know sometimes in like day-to-day -day english gimmick is sort of like an insulting term that's not how i mean it here i just mean that this is their unique feature uh like these are things that these cards do that other cards don't do uh okay so let's move on to our uh, Midnight Suns. so louise hastings this is a defenders affiliated one two one with range and it's one of a kind. When Louise enters, or I'm sorry, when Louise appears, draw a card or shuffle each evil character in each enemy KO pile into its owner's deck. Uh, I'm not sure. 
I guess against Sentinels, this would feel pretty good to take all the Sentinels and throw them back into the deck so the, the Alpha Sentinels lose all their keyword bonuses. But in most games, I'm probably not going to want to reload my opponent's deck with things that they could draw to hurt me again. I mean, may, maybe if it's a bunch of low cost guys in their KO pile and it could potentially mess up their draws. No, I think most of the time you're going to play this guy and draw one, which means this is a strictly worse prowler. <laughs> like he, you play him, you draw one, his stats aren't great and he's one of a kind. So this is basically prowler, but not as good. Uh, next up, Salmon Buchanan. I don't understand what is going on with this guy's chest. His armor looks not great. <laughs> this guy looks funny. Okay, so he's a two cost, four, two, one with range. Now compare that to the two cost printed two, two, one. So this guy is printed four, two, one with range. Okay. Improved Exorcist Gun. Again, he's one of a kind. Improved Exorcist Gun. When Samson stuns an evil defending supporting character in ranged combat, that's a lot of ifs, remove it from the game. Then search its owner deck for each copy of that character and remove them from the game. So this basically does what the Exorcist Gun equipment invention does, except it's built into a character. I like this much better. Like, you don't have to set this up. You just pay two and then you kill an enemy to drop and you remove every copy of it from the game. Do you get a look at their hand too? Range combat, remove it from the game, search the deck for each copy and remove them. So you don't get to hit the hand, which is probably fair. I would like to hit the hand, but I kind of, yeah, it's this card's already doing a lot for a two drop. Uh, Johnny blaze, three costs, two, six, one, AKA Ghost Rider, Hellfire Shotgun. When Johnny strikes an evil defending front row supporting character from his front row, disperse it. Man, these are starting to feel like magic cards. There's so many words on these cards. All right, so when Johnny strikes an evil defending front row supporting character, okay? And he has to be attacking from his front row then it basically gives you lethal plus it disperses it loses all powers and remove it from the game yes this is good this is like uh iron fist back in the day but you don't have to pay for it yeah there's some restrictions on it but you're basically attacking into something and then removing it from the game no matter how much health it has no matter how much defense it has he doesn't have to do anything other than just tap you of course shock to the system shuts this whole thing down but this is a very playable three drop and also not one of a kind. Three costs, 242, two, Victoria Montesi. One of a kind. Man, why are so many of these one of a kind? Occult family. When Victoria appears, you may search your deck and KO pile for the Montesi formula spell, reveal it, and put it into your hand. Victoria can cast the Montesi formula, ignoring play restrictions. I don't remember what the Montesi formula does. All right, so we looked it up. One of a kind, blue spell. Uh, one page in the Book of Sins. You may play this only if the Dark Hold is on your side, but we get to ignore play restrictions. Choose a keyword power, main phase, choose a keyword power and stun each enemy supporting character with that power. If you choose a power with vampire in its name, KO those characters instead. So we have to, presumably having the correct spellcaster is considered a play restriction. Uh... I think there was a note about her in the liner notes. Let me click back up here. So the Montesi formula is a plot twist found in the Into Darkness issue. Normally it can only be played if you have a spellcaster and Darkhold on your side. However, Victoria Montesi allows you to ignore both of these restrictions. However, she must still pay a blue to cast the spell. Okay, well that does answer all of my questions. Uh... What about all the times where you draw this and don't have dark hold and don't have the spellcaster and like, no, I'm not, come on, I'm not going to play. So I guess she only fits in a deck. I guess if you play her and cast it immediately, but it, she's one of a kind. So if you play her, you search that thing out, she gets killed. Well, now you just can't ever cast it. Now it's just a, a card rotting in your hand, I guess soon to be a resource for, I don't know. This one feels too cute by half it, it. 
yeah, I get what they're trying to do. I, I actually do like and appreciate them weaving these kind of thematic elements together across multiple expansions, taking a card that I have never really paid much attention to because of how restrictive it is to play it and giving me this whole new way to add that card into my deck. I like all of that. The problem is the words one of a kind. I don't <laughs> like, so I have a one in 60 chance to get this card and a one in 60 chance to draw the Montessi formula and have it be a dead card unless I see this. I, I don't know. I don't know about that. Maybe if there's a format where I like really, really need the Montessi formula first, then this is an extra way to get to it. And in that sense, okay, cool. But I don't think I'm going to play Victoria just because it puts Montessi into the realm of playability in my deck. All right, four costs, Frank Drake, Defender Affiliated, 7-5 with range. I do like that seven attack with range on turn four. That's awesome. I don't like one of a kind. The Engineering of Violence. When Frank appears, choose an evil enemy supporting character with a superpower and stun it. Ooh, that's gross. And all Night Stalkers have dodge. Uh, that Coming into play and just being able to straight up stun somebody, I was talking about how that looks good on a six drop with blackout, and I guess that was a daze, so not quite the same as a stun. Obviously, stun is better. Uh, but this is on a four drop. That's even better. Like, yeah, this guy is probably playable just for that effect. You kill well but then again it has to be evil and it has to have a superpower oh man there's so many restrictions on these cards uh, Hannibal King I love this art it's weirdly cropped because you've got part of somebody's head in the foreground but I really like the sort of extreme rule of thirds thing they're doing here Hannibal King defenders affiliated 662 cost five one of a kind Detective work. When Hannibal appears, look at an enemy player's hand. Okay, I like that. Uh, Night Stalkers on your side have Rage. When one gets attacked, put a plus one, plus one counter on it. Uh, yeah, this is obviously trying to play into the whole Night Stalker thing. Like, clearly they want the Lilins and the Night Stalkers to fight each other. Uh, I just, I hate how so many of these cards are one of a kind. Uh, Morbius, I think we talked about this guy before. He is a 9-5 with Flight. Uh, during melee comp, he has Ferocious, so he strikes before characters without Ferocious in melee. Uh, when Morbius KOs an evil defending character and survives, he gets a Vitality counter and plus three, plus three counters on him. Uh, yeah, that's playable even if you don't get the evil part and you never see the Vitality. Just being able to come down on turn five with nine damage and Ferocious is, is a playable card. Not, not the most exciting, but if people play along and they have evil characters like you need them to, well, now all of a sudden your five drop turned into a six drop and he's ready to do it again. Like, that's cool. Blade. Six costs, seven, seven, two with range. Gives all Night Starkers martial artists, which is the part of him that I think is really cool. And when he appears, put a plus one counter on any number of good characters and a minus one counter on any number of evil characters. So I, I guess I don't need to keep saying the same stuff about good and evil. You control whether you're going to get those plus ones on your side. You have much less control over whether your enemy is going to get those minus one counters. So if you can build this guy into a deck where these plus one counters hit to get enough value out of it, I mean, a six cost seven, seven, that's, well, stats aren't super great, but with Martial Artist, he becomes a 9-9. Nine nine. That's quite a bit better. And giving other Night Stalkers Martial Artists, like some of the other ones we've looked at today or ones that we've seen before in previous expansions, this guy seems playable, certainly within the Night Stalker deck. Maybe more widely? Probably not. Probably he needs his the Night Stalkers to work. And finally, Ghost Rider, Asterix, Ghost Rider, Asterix, Defenders Affiliated, 13-1-2. He can't be struck in melee combat or can't be struck in combat, which makes that one defense look a little funny. And while he's attacking, enemy characters can't gain defense or plus one character counters. So 13 attack for seven, that is for sure gonna get through and they can't deal with him unless they have the ability to put minus one counters on him. This is a seven drop that I think maybe more than any of the other cards in this box actually maybe has some playability outside of the silos that these cards are clearly designed to go into. So in summary, what do I think of this expansion? Uh, is this really the whole expansion? No plot twists, only one main character. Uh, huh. What, 
what a strange, what a strange box. Uh, so on the positive side, I definitely like that Super Awesome Games gave us another sort of one trick pony focused main character and deck combo. Like we kind of see this with the Leviathan mom where she clearly needs to play with the other Leviathans. We kind of see this with uh, Sentinels really kind of needing to play with other Sentinels in order to work. And now we have Lilin and Lilith. And is this deck going to be good? Well, from a kitchen table perspective, I think this is awesome. I really like the idea behind what's going on here and and synergy payoff between the cards like all that feels really cool to me where i am maybe a little bit worried about the lilith lilin deck is that if you aren't able to get your stuff going if your opponent isn't playing any good characters at all or if they're kind of wise to what you're trying to do there are just so many ways to disrupt this. And if you disrupt the Lillian synergies or you lose the ability to get those attack bonuses while swinging into good characters, what we have is a deck that filters for cards that none of them have that great of stats or that great of abilities. I mean, they're all kind of cool. They're all okay. Like, I don't think any of these cards are just like bad inside the Lillian deck, but none of them are like, door busting barn burner knockout flashy bomb drop cards either they they all kind of just do a thing now maybe it could be this is one of those decks where the sum of the parts is greater or the sum of the whole is greater than the parts it could be that when all this stuff works together the synergies kind of mesh in such a way that it feels stronger than it looks on paper this looks like a casual deck to me though this looks like kitchen table stuff for people who enjoy either a, these characters, or B, these kinds of mechanics. Like having a, a really thematic deck is a certain kind of enjoyable way to play the game. Most of the time in the competitive scene, our decks are less about theme and they're more about mechanics. And they're kind of like grab bags of a bunch of different characters that do valuable things rather than being actual on team uh, characters that affiliated and work together in the comics. And that's okay. I also think it's okay to have decks that lean the other way and are clearly all about theme. And that's where this one is. Uh, is this a kid kaiju? No, I do not think this is a kid kaiju in terms of power level. Uh, probably it's a kid kaiju in terms of theme, yes. But in terms of power level, I think this is going to be better than kid kaiju. But I'm hard pressed to see the Lilith deck making that much of an impact on tournament play. Similarly, these Night Stalker cards, while there are a few here like Ghost Rider and, or sorry, Johnny Blaze, the three drop uh, and the Ghost Rider seven drop. These are cards that I can definitely see making their way to the competitive table. Certainly Samson Buchanan, that Im improved Exorcist gun ability is excellent. That is truly excellent if your opponent's playing an evil character. It, but if your opponent isn't playing along and isn't doing what you need them to do, well then, Johnny Blaze looks a lot worse. Uh, fortunately, Ghost Rider sort of dodges the good evil bullet here, uh, and he's going to be good regardless of what kind of cards your opponent puts in their deck, unless they put minus one counters in their deck, in which case he's in a lot of trouble. So this, this as an expansion, uh, I feel like it's kind of poorly positioned for overall impact on competitive metas. Now, that being said... Super Awesome Games does have a tendency to give us featured formats that really strongly encourage the playing of the new cards. So if we get a format that's like another good versus evil format, well, all of a sudden these cards start to look a lot better. If you know you're going to be going into a format where half the decks you face are all people that are playing evil or all people that are playing good, maybe, you, and, and these play restrictions don't require you to have your deck a certain way. So I could play Lilins in my deck and also run some Night Stalkers if I wanted extra bonus stuff against evil characters and extra bonus stuff against good characters in the same deck. I don't know if that's gonna work. I don't know that I'm necessarily suggesting people should do that, but I like that that's the way these restrictions are in place. It's not that it's making you build your deck a certain way it or necessarily super punishing you if you don't go a certain direction. It just, you can mix and match this stuff together to try to deal with whatever you think you're going to see in your meta. Um, man, 
So this is a tough expansion to kind of give my, my thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs medium to. Uh, the cards in here that I like, I really like, like the seven cost Ghost Rider, the five drop Morbius. I like those a lot. Uh, the Lilith deck as a deck, I am excited to play. I, I don't think I'm going to play it in a competitive meta, but I am excited to bring it to Kitchen Table Versus with my friends. That looks like a lot of fun. So I think overall, I do give this expansion a thumbs up. There are cards in here that make me want to play Versus, but if you're a competitive player looking for the next hot thing to shake up your deck, shake up your, your local comp competitive meta, I'm not sure this is going to be the box for you. This this feels like very much a box where they went theme first. And yes, they go theme first in a lot of the boxes. But this one was like theme overdrive. And I'm okay with that. I, I like the occasional thematic heavy expansion. And that's, to me, that's what this one feels like. So I think, so I think I'll leave it there. Overall, I give Children of Lilith kind of a tentative thumbs up. There, there's things in here that I'm excited about. But there's also some like weird stuff about this that kind of hampers my overall excitement level about the expansion. So still positive, but not not a home run the way some of the uh, other recent expansions have been. All right. This has been the build phase. I'm Mr. Ben. And until next time, you should go win some games.